So it's without further ado, I'd love to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker, Joanna Shields. Thank you for being here with us. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um, well, good morning. And um, I think from the queues outside, we can safely say that this is, with 7,000 people joining us, um, the hottest ticket anywhere in the world right now, which is fitting because this is one of the most important topics in the world right now. Um, COGX is a celebration of extraordinary potential of AI, blockchain, and emerging technologies. Now, these, it's about the potential of these technologies to transform our world for the better. But it's also about tackling some of the biggest challenges that lie ahead. Tabitha Charlie and the amazing team at Cognition X have brought you some of the world's top thinkers, scientists, academics, coders, and creators. But they've also done something that I would like to say is um, rather splendid and that's created a global community that I think we all feel very special to be part of. Over the next two days, you're gonna gain a lot of insights from each other and wisdom that you'll share. Um, there's a potential to make this a defining event, which is why um, it, should, it should be, and it's great that you're all here, because we're here to discuss technologies that will change our lives completely. For more than a quarter century, we've been traveling at warp speed, at what we're calling the, used to call the digital revolution. Well, now we're just about to enter an entirely new one. And this one represents a quantum leap in terms of impact. I've witnessed my share of technology revolutions since I rocked up in Silicon Valley in the late 1980s with everything I owned in my car. Now, that's not necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily make me a revolutionary, but it does give me an interesting perspective on why they happen and what they teach us a perspective about how technology shapes our society, and even though most of us would prefer to think it goes the other way around. Now, when we think about revolutions, we think about progress. We think about new ideas, new paradigms. But interestingly enough, the word revolution comes from the Latin word revolvere, which actually means to roll back. And it's only recently that I began to think about revolutions in that literal sense. Because I've always been this self-confessed tech utopian. I spent my life focusing on the positive impact of technology, how it can help us solve problems, how it empowers and enlightens us, and how it has the potential to bring us all together. But technological revolutions don't always turn out as planned. Looking to history for a few examples, the Benedictine monks who invented the mechanical clock they set out to become better devotees of God and ended up giving industry and capitalism its heartbeat. Gutenberg set out to spread the word of the church, but the printing press actually ended up breaking its monopoly on religion. Sir Tim Berners-Lee wanted to create an online space for the free exchange of ideas, but instead the web, in his words, became a handful of platforms that control which ideas and opinions are seen and shared. Now, none of these inventions ended up quite like their inventors intended. The late media critic Neil Postman described these unintended consequences as Faustian, as Faustian bargain. He said, what a new technology will do is no more important than a new technology will undo. When the digital revolution started 30 years ago, the mantra was that the internet would create this utopian village this wonderful place that would bring diverse people together and diverse ideas in a celebration of knowledge. But somewhere around the time of the Arab Spring in 2011, I began to notice patterns that I hadn't seen before and things that concerned me deeply. I started to see the negative side effects of the global village and what it was doing to society and the impact it was having on real people. Not that theoretical construct of users that we always talk about in the tech industry, but on real lives. What started out as a beautiful idea of bringing the world closer together began unraveling, or if we are true to the definition of revolution, it began rolling back. And as time went by, cracks began to show in the fine veneer of the digital narrative. Now today, of course, you'd have to be blind not to see those cracks for they are deep enough to subsume us. But back then, any questions about the negative impact of tech on society would brand you a heretic. And when problems continued to surface, we assured ourselves that everything was just gonna be fine. 
that any unpleasant side effect was the price to pay for progress, but that it was worth it. And whilst acknowledged that darkness, too, inhabited our brave new world, we were blinded by the light. And the light shone brightly. Digital technologies gave us more of absolutely everything. Our platform, algorithmically optimized world gave us more choice, more friendships, more information, more convenience. And more in society is always equated with better, right? Well, I mention this as a cautionary tale because I truly believe that this is the most exciting time to be alive. And we have the potential to do good at scale unlike any time in human history. But as we develop the next wave of technologies and we apply AI to literally everything that we do, use, and experience, we have to be careful what we optimize for and who benefits from that optimization. We need to think about how we ensure beneficial outcomes for all and how we keep power in check. Marshall McLuhan, who many refer to as the prophet of the information age, he said, when man is overwhelmed by information, he resorts to myth. Now, myth, he said, is inclusive, time-saving, and fast. For our industry, the myth is the algorithm. I remember a quote from a teenager back in 2008 who was asked where he goes to read the news. He answered, he doesn't go anywhere. He said, if the news is that important, it will find me. Now, an entire generation of products was built on that idea. Indeed, an entire generation of entrepreneurs on the ideal of an algorithm finding what you need or want when you need it or want it without requiring you to do any hard work or make any difficult choices. Well, we got exactly what we wished for, but with a whole bunch of unintended consequences. The remarkably prescient sociologist Eric Hoffer wrote 65 years ago, and listen to this quote, he said, revolutions are not set in motion to realize radical changes, but actually it is drastic change which sets the stage for revolution in the first place. Hoffer argued that when a population undergoing drastic change is without abundant opportunities for individual action and self-advancement, it develops a hunger for pride, faith, and unity. It becomes receptive to all a manner of proselytizing. Now this sounds uncomfortably familiar in the context of the world today. When you combine the angst resulting from dramatic changes in society with algorithms that amplify passions and connect people with others who might share their same views, you have a toxic cocktail, an asymmetry of passion which manipulates people into believing that their views represent the majority or mainstream, when in reality, they are a minority or fringe. This in turn makes them receptive to misinformation and normalizes extreme opinion on a mass scale. And this is the most divisive unintended consequence. Needless to say, if, if drastic change is what sets a revolution in motion, one can only begin to imagine what the next revolution is going to be like. Years from now, when history writes the chapter, the age of artificial intelligence, will it celebrate the immense benefits that technology has delivered and the great human progress that's followed? Or will it be a requiem of regret for what we as humans have lost? That is the most important question. And if AI as a revolution is, as Google CEO Sundar Pichai has said, probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on, more profound than electricity and fire, then the human race is at a turning point. I say this without a doubt because when compared to AI, the digital revolution with its huge issues around data, privacy, and security will seem like a dress rehearsal. We are about to unlock an incredibly powerful force. And if the consensus is that AI is bigger than anything we've seen before, then it follows that its benefits and its risks will be magnified too. I nearly said that we don't have to worry about the good things that AI will do, but then I realized how foolish that was. 
Good will depend entirely on the perspective of the person creating it. So who decides what good is or who will benefit from it? How will good outcomes from, from AI be distributed? How will we limit bad outcomes? And who's going to be the arbiter? Lest you think these questions are trivial, we have to remind ourselves what happened when we forgot to ask and answer them last time, when we abdicated ourselves from thinking about the implications of technology and for taking responsibility for our innovations. We need to think hard about these questions for which um, artificial intelligence is an answer. And we need to ask the right questions because some questions are more important than others. So with no disrespect, how to serve the right ad at the right time to the right person is not really an important question. But what's important to note is even frivolous questions can start from a meaningful place, like how to best connect people and share information. But when a hunger for monetization demands that inventions become ubiquitous and for one technology or platform to dominate in order to achieve that, the focal point of that question changes. It no longer serves its original master. It chooses a different one. And so, in the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you three questions I hope they all consider over the course of the next two days. These are not the only questions, or necessarily even the right ones, but they're worth considering if we want to get this revolution right. The first question references what is known as Moravec's paradox, which says that while it's easy to make computers exhibit adult-like performance on intelligence tests, it is difficult to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. So in other words, the machines are much better at things we humans find difficult and really bad at things that we find easy. Now, paradoxes and principles like this are comforting to us in times of uncertainty. That is, until they're proven wrong. So what happens when machines find a way to easily do everything that we do? Have we already given machines more power than we'd like to admit? Perhaps more power than we're even aware of? In, Yuv in Yuval Noah Harari's bestseller, Homo Deus, he talks about a post-human world where technology enhances human capabilities beyond natural limits to create a new form of human. Well, until recently, that sounded like science fiction. But today, we already have wearable devices, virtual and augmented reality, biomedical implants, robotics, and someday soon, a brain-computer interface. Machines are already making many choices for us. And you know, in many ways, these developments are working out just fine. So who doesn't want an early warning system before you suffer a heart attack? Or an augmented reality experience that helps you deal with PTSD? Or a robotic limb that, if you're injured in a car accident, gives you a new lease on life? But, what? but when it comes to abdicating responsibilities for our decisions to machines, how far do we go? What boundaries do we set? And who gets to set them? Before the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman died in 1988, he left on his blackboard at Caltech the following message. He said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Well, until recently, for any given machine, you probably could find a few people in the world who really understood how it worked. Early expert systems enabled us to trace each step of an algorithm all the way to the result. But in the past few years, we've seen AI and machine learning evolve in ways that under Feynman's definition, we no longer understand. But more importantly, that we no longer feel the need to. So what happens when our relationship with technology stops being that of creator and creation? What happens when AI starts to create itself? I know there are going to be a lot of conversations in the coming days about superintelligent AI. And to be honest, I have no idea how long it will take for AI to develop into sentient beings, or if that's even a real possibility. But I do know that delaying conversations about the impact of technology is never wise. Technology is not neutral. That's because we as humans are not neutral, even if we'd like to think so. 
Unconscious bias is already a huge problem in society, and we must take care that machines are not making decisions about who has access and who is excluded. So what happens when bias is baked into an algorithm? Well, I read recently that there was a startup in Spain who had an innovative solution. It's offering AI developers an ethics module available on an SD card to ensure that your next line of code behaves well. Well, it's a nice idea, but it raises a glaringly obvious question. If you were to integrate an ethics module into your code, whose ethics would you choose to embed? Now, last week, Google announced a, a set of new AI principles. And I think it's great to see a company taking the initiative and clarifying where it stands and what boundaries it will not cross when it comes to AI. But these issues are bigger than any one company, organization, or country, for that matter. Cognitive scientist Yosha Bach has said that the motives of our artificial minds are going to be those of the organizations, corporations, groups, and individuals that make use of their intelligence. He goes on to say that every society will get the AI it deserves. So my final question to you is, how do we get the AI that we deserve? How do we get the AI that ensures that we, as a society, can fix our biggest problems and provide well-being for all? Now, idealism is the starting point of every revolution. We're all here today because we believe it's possible to get this right. I know this too because I see it in my work every day at Benevolent AI. We push the boundaries of artificial intelligence and machine learning to unlock the power of data from decades of scientific publications, open data sets, and research to identify and understand the underlying causes of disease and develop new treatments for patients. I see how scientists augment and refine AI to produce breakthrough results, and how unconventional thinking combined with purposeful technology can deliver real promise for drug discovery. And I couldn't be more proud to be part of the benevolent team that is doing just that. So at this time of dystopian prophecies of machines ending humanity, I believe that AI applied in the right way will advance and improve lives and meet some of the world's greatest challenges. From health to clean energy, climate change, food security, and poverty. Let's just make sure that we focus all our best and brightest talent on solving those problems. And let's ensure that the application of AI will be an expression of the very highest ethic ethical standards known to humankind. In an article entitled, How the Enlightenment Ends, in this month's issue of The Atlantic, Henry Kissinger, of all people, who's 95 years old now, says that we must expect AI to make mistakes faster and of greater magnitude than humans do. Well, maybe Kissinger is right. Yes, we should expect AI to make mistakes faster, but we also should expect AI to make progress and positive impact faster and of greater magnitude. And that is, after all, why we're all here. To learn from past mistakes, to ensure that the choices we make will, will, as we cross the threshold into a new era, will deliver a better future for all. Thank you very much.